Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for attending another ShareWise webinar. I'm your host, Sebastian Cerecedo, um, and today we're joined here by Ian Roger. He's the CEO of Ginger Lee Lithium. Um, so quickly how the presentation will work. Uh, Ian will, will sort of just go through a quick presentation of the company. Um, and after that, you know, I'd invite everyone, if they have any questions they want to ask, feel free to put it in the Q&A function. And um, we'll have a couple of questions from ShareWise ourselves. So um, over to you, Ian. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. And thanks, everyone, for joining. I'll uh, just load up the presentation. Okay. Look, uh, no more disclaimer, um, forward-looking statements, etc. cetera. Um, I'll move on. Look, uh, this, the story behind uh, Jinder Lee and uh, McDermott is a really an incredible one. And I'm excited to sort of walk you through it today. Um, McDermott was uh, pegged by Perth Microcap um, during COVID um, in the Western United States, you know, on the eve of the in, um, inflation Inflation Reduction Act, um, even better, um, the the deposit was uh, dropped by one of our major competitors without uh, drilling a hole. Uh, we had expiration success uh, with the very first hole and uh, through a number of drill programs, we'll, we'll build it out as we highlight on this slide to be the largest um, uh, lithium deposit in the US. Um, it's a significant size globally. It's bigger than both Greenbushes and uh, Pilgangora for an Australian reference point. It's a, it's a sedimentary deposit, uh, similar in size and scale uh, to our, um, our neighbours in Lithium Americas who are developing the, the Thacker Pass uh, project and they count General Motors as a major shareholder and are funded um, in the tune of multi-billion dollars by the, by the US uh, federal government. Uh, we have a very strategic location uh, being in the, in the US, uh, close to the, the build-out of the, of the EV supply chain. In fact, you sort of drive past the, the Tesla factory when getting to site from, from, from Reno. Um, our project will produce a, a lithium chemical, um, a lithium carbonate, um, which can be used directly in, in uh, gigafactories. And it's not a concentrate um, dig and ship to China. So that's a really key differentiator compared to a lot of our Western Australian uh, lithium peers. Uh, as a result of these factors, we've attracted the interests of uh, a number of sort of strategics, the most notable one being uh, POSCO, who um, we've got an MOU to um, work jointly on the project and they're a partner to to uh, General Motors in, in North America. In terms of the market, uh, look, the currently the, the, the lithium market's facing some headwinds due to, due to oversupply, but fundamentally um, the demand is strong and we expect deficits um, towards the end of the decade, which is really poised, poised well for McDermott's um, development timeframe. Um, in terms of US um, support, we, we uniquely uh, place as a domestic project to, to tap a lot of um, uh, US government um, support it, it has a potential to really enhance equity returns. I'll touch on more on this in, in the presentation, but we've recently executed an agreement with the US Department of Energy um, to do work on the project. Um, we've, we also have a grant application on foot with the Department of Defense, um, which could potentially um, materially co-fund the next stage of work. So really exciting stuff there with the potential for a longer dated um, uh, uh, loan programs from the US government to, to eventually build the project. In terms of what's ahead, um, we've got a really exciting six to 12 months uh, ahead of us. Our PFS is due out later this year, um, as well as, as I mentioned, um, you know, potential for grant funding, but also enga engagement um, with potential um, strategic partners. So with that, I'll uh, move on to the next slide. Just look a bit more um, about Jinder Lee. Um, clearly, um, you know, we've um, been beaten up like a lot of other, other lithium companies. Um, we're, in, we're reaching the sort of bottom of the, the uh, lithium price cycle at the moment. Um, but we've, you know, we've seen this before and we were, we were a unique um, for a junior mining company. We've been around uh, over 20 years since our IPO and we've, we've delivered a lot of value for shareholders uh, through the project um, generator model. And as a result, um, we didn't raise equity for circa 17 years post our IPO, which is really rare for, for um, you know, junior mining companies in particular. As a result, um, you know, we've really maintained, you know, capital discipline and a tight capital structure. We've got very um, 
uh, relatively few shares on, on issue. We've got a very um, loyal and supportive um, shareholder base. The top 20 hold 70% of the, the stock. Um, Lindsay um, Dudfield, who, who's our biggest shareholder there, he's, he's a founder and executive director. Um, you know, never sold a share. My board um, and myself are all investors in the company, so very well aligned uh, with 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 um, with investors. And really, Jindalee's strategy was always uh, to find the company making asset, and we believe you know we've done that in in McDermott, which I'll step through later. And that's really required a pivot um, to to build out the team as we transition from explorer to developer, which sort of links um, nicely into um, my next slide here. Jinder Lee has a really high caliber board management team, particularly given the relative size of the company and it really speaks uh, to the value that we see in the asset. Uh, Wayne and I joined uh, earlier this year as uh, chair and CEO respectively. Wayne brings a, a wealth of experience um, in financing large projects. He's currently the chairman of uh, Pantoro uh, and was recently Deutsche Bank's uh, senior representative um, rep in, in, um, in Western Australia. Uh, I'm a mining engineer by background. I cut my teeth at Rio Tinto across two large greenfield mine developments um, before transitioning into investment and merchant banking um, roles uh, uh, where I held, held senior positions in, in London predominantly, but also Sydney. Um, I then made my way back in the corporate world. Most recently, I was um, project director at Oz Minerals, um, looking after the, amongst other things, a downstream um, nickel project, looking at the technical and commercial work streams to integrate um, uh, Western Australian nickel asset into the battery value chain through producing a uh, intermediate um, product and 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 uh, looking at partnership opportunities in that regard. Um, in terms of yeah, I've mentioned Lindsay. Uh, he's got a strong track record in the exploration space. Um, Brett Marsh, um, our US VP, uh, um, has a real deep experience across the project lifecycle and key to driving our activities on the ground and our engagement with US uh, stakeholders. And then the rest of the board is really well credentialed and, and, and bring that uh, diversity of skill set. Um, uh, Darren's an experienced corporate lawyer, a strong lithium track record with Neo Metals. Paul's uh, one of the few people with a track record in actually operations experience in, in the lithium space. He's being the former um, CEO of Mineral Resources Lithium Business, but also he's now um, CEO of Core, Core Lithium. So we've got a really strong board management. Uh, in terms of uh, benchmarking, before I got into the asset, um, a bit more about McDermott, I really wanted to set the scene. On the left, you can see McDermott is is easily the, the largest lithium uh, sedimentary deposit um, and a similar grade to our peers. And on the right really just highlights how cheap we are relative to that same peer group. Uh, clearly, Lithium America is an ear, um, both sort of at, at the point of construction, uh, much more advanced, um, but I really have include them there as, as the goalposts. And, but the others in the middle of the table, uh, uh, you know, similar stage, differing asset quality at traded levels, you know, well above where we are. So we think at these prices, um, Jindalee really offers great leverage um, to the upside um, into an improving lithium market over the next, you know, 12 to 24 months um, as we continue to uh, de-risk the project. Uh, as I highlighted earlier, the, the next six to 12 months is going to be really pivotal for, for, for Jinder Lee with a number of sort of near-term catalysts in the, in the pipeline. To set the scene, we've, we've recently six, successfully completed a $6 million capital raise, which will allow us to complete um, the McDermott PFS with a number of um, value optimizations incorporated. And it, it's really important to emphasize that there's been limited um, parameters in the market around um, the production and cost profile of, of McDermott and hence the importance of really um, delivering this PFS and educating um, the mar market as well as potential partners. Um, but we expect the PFS to outline a large scale uh, competitive source of lithium chemicals over, over half a century. So a really um, a generational um, asset. Uh, given the um, strategic um, nature of the asset, our, our strategy is really aimed at targeting US government support and, and downstream partnerships, which is sort of reflected in, in some of these catalysts on the, on the page here. Um, we've recently executed this agreement with the Department of Energy um, alongside US universities and the local permitting agency to look at um, ways to improve um, the, the processing flow sheet at, at McDermott, um, which was a huge endorsement. I'll step through that in, uh, on, in, the, in the coming slides. 
Um, we're also um, working with the Department of Defence on a, on a funding um, grant funding uh, opportunity to fund the next stage of work, which we expect to hear uh, later in, in this year. Um, in terms of partnerships, we've been actively working with uh, POSCO. Um, they've done um, work in Korea um, this year uh, on, on uh, sample sent um, from McDermott. And, um, and really, you know, we plan to sit down with them um, once the, the PFS is out and discuss um, our next steps. Um, and lastly, um, we int intend to sort of um, engage more formally with partners um, uh, um, post the PFS. And, and as I mentioned earlier, PFS is keen in, in really um, providing them the, the parameters to look at and potentially invest into. So um, we look forward to sort of uh, engaging potential with potential partners um, into into next year and we now have um, with the funding with that we we closed um, in August as well as um, our ongoing agreement with Mercer we have a sort of runway ahead of us to be able to sort of execute on that strategy a bit more um, about McDermott um, as you can see it's ideally um, situated uh, to, to service a build out of the US um, supply chains from the map you can see the large number of gigafactories, both operating and announced, um, which will drive a large uh, increase in the US um, demand for domestic um, lithium carbonate. It, even if that ramp up is, is slower than expected, you know, we're talking hundreds of kilotons. Um, at the moment, there's only about three kilotons produced by one mine um, in the US. So it really highlights, um, I guess, the elephant in the room is, you know, where it's going to come from. You know, um, our view is certainly that projects um, like ours and others uh, will be um, required to be developed um, um, to be able to meet this um, demand. And, and, and with the backdrop really being that the Chinese control 70% of, um, of the lithium chemical market. So, you know, domestic um, refining capacity uh, like um, what McDermott can deliver is really important. In terms of our project, um, our claims straddle uh, the Oregon and Nevada border, but our claims are 100% in Oregon. Um, it's located on um, federally owned land, which is administered by um, the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and that's important. Um, it's the same as a number of um, our key advanced peers being Lithium Americas and Iron Ear, and there's a clear pathway uh, to, to permitting the project. Uh, people, I guess, often ask us being based um, in Oregon, um, it's a less well-known mining jurisdiction. Um, you know, what's it like operating there? We point to the fact um, we we're drilling um, within three months of pegging the claims and have drilled almost um, every year since. Um, um, the pro project is particularly, uh, sorry, located in a particularly, um, you know, historically disadvantaged section of the state um, and US more broadly. And it's a long way from the more wealthy North um, and a pre previously prospered on the back of, excuse me, <clears throat> um, mercury mining. In fact, there's um, there's some old uh, derelict mercury mining adjacent to our claims there. So the project really has the potential to drive the value for a broader range of stakeholders as the overlap between the green economy and economic development. And that's really been reflected with the buy-in that we've got um, at different levels of the US government. Um, I'll, I'll touch on it in, in the slide a bit later, but you know we've seen you know um, public um, you know um, you know political support for some of the initiatives um, that we've been able to execute. The final point I wanted to really um, make on this slide is that we've made a lot of progress um, in a short period of time. You know, 2018, we pegged it. 2023, um, it became the the um, largest deposit in the US. Around the same time, we executed that agreement with POSCO. Um, and um, mid last year, we appointed, um, you know, Fluor Corporation. Uh, Fluor uh uh, one, you know, they're a global EPCM firm, but headquartered in, in the in the US. Um, they've got world class um, execution capabilities, but more than that, they're one of the few groups that actually have a lot of experience in the sedimentary um, lithium deposits. So we've been really imp impressed with what they've brought to bear, and it's um, I guess quite unusual for a, for a, a small company um, like ours to get the buy in from an engineering firm like that. But really, it was seen as critical from our side um, to get that sort of um, engineering firm involved early. Um, because it's part of attracting, you know, the right partners to develop this asset in the coming years. A bit more on on the uh, resource. Um, 
it, it, the deposit's clearly huge. And I guess we like to characterize this style of uh, deposit as the copper porphyries in the lithium world. You know, they're large, lower grade, you know, generational assets. Um, the deposits uh, are formed, or this particular deposit is formed through sediments at the, <clears throat> excuse me, bottom of the previous uh, Keldara Lake. So basically, you know, um, rim of a volcano, shallow lake. Um, there's a bit of a debate about secondary enrichment, but essentially sediments that are laid down like layers on a cake. Some of these units um, have elevated lithium grades and four of those have been the focus of our work um, to date. Uh, the material is very, uh, very soft um, for any engineers in the audience, like the bond index is, is single digits. Um, so it's free dig, no blasting, no grinding at all. Um, and it, it our crops, um, the, the strip ratio uh, in, you know, for the PFS will be in the order of say one to one and a half um, uh, waste tons to ore tons. That's just incredibly low for any style of mineralization. Um, the typical spodumene deposits sort of four to seven waste tons to ore tons. So it's, it's a very unique um, uh, deposit. And really some of those elements of what, what's been incorporated in, into our PFS around value enhancing opportunities because, because the mining costs uh, are so low, um, there's the opportunity to sort of target higher grade um, sections um, over multi-decades. And as a result, we expect, you know, the head grade of, of our PFS mine plan to be materially higher than um, our resource head, head grade for at least the first couple of decades of operation in the order of sort of 2000 um, uh, PPM, which really, you know, helps um, generate a, a strong economic return. The final point here I, I sort of wanted to make is there's plenty of scope to grow grow this deposit further as we sort of highlight sort of open um, in a number of different areas. But really our focus going forward is better understanding what we've got as we expect, you know, the well, the, you know, the PFS to, to outline a very large scale long life production, that'll only be a very, very small um, portion of the overall um, resource. So it's really about better understanding how we can unlock the embedded um, optionality and flexibility in what we've already got. In terms of the um, processing flow sheet, we've been able to leverage um, the work done um, by our, our more advanced um, peers, but both at um, with the Americas and Ionia. Uh, we often get compared to, um, you know, Western Australian spodumene developers um, and, and also Canadian um, ones. And I think the important thing to highlight is that our flow sheet produces um, with him chemical. I'll, I've sort of made this point, but it's an important one. It's a high value chemical. Um, it's not a dig and ship or concentrate to, to China story. And that's a really important consideration from a US domestic angle. There's bipartisan support to decouple supply chains from, from China, given that they control the lithium chemical market. And for example, you know, 95 odd percent of, of Australian um, uh, spodumene goes to China for refining into chemicals. So for that to get into the US markets, particularly difficult given um, given you know, the preference um, and political support on both sides of the aisle in, in the US. And really the, um, you know, the, our project is, is the equivalent of having a um, spodumene mine plus a concentrator plus a refiner. So really the capital and operating costs need to um, be viewed in, in that context. From a processing view, um, it, it's reasonably quite straightforward. There's two key steps. One is a beneficiation, um, as I said, very safe soft ore so it's essentially mixing the ore screening out the fines that contain the lithium um, that's a clay fragment and um, rejecting the the coarse sand or gang material and so we lose you know 25 odd percent we keep 90 odd percent of the the lithium and so you have this upgrading effect into um into the the, the proceeding um uh, process flow sheet, which is really an acid acid leach, atmospheric acid leach, um, to bring the metals into solution. Then it's cleaned up into a lithium um, grade, um, sorry, with a battery grade lithium um, carbonate through a, a number of different steps. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, that back end of the plant does look very similar to, I guess, the spodumene conversion route, except that um, it it doesn't include fine grinding. It doesn't include cal cal calcining. Um, there's no flotation, so. Um, comparatively, it's less um, complex and, and energy intense and consists of sort of proven equipment used uh, throughout the um, industry. The, the key point is that on, on our flow sheet now is that we've, um, we've validated it all. Um, we've, part of the PFS, we've tested um, from, all, from, from taking the ore all the way through to battery grade lithium carbonate, which we produced in, in uh, July. And that was a really major milestone from a technical perspective. Um, 
um, perspective and it really yielded that test work uh, yielded better than expected results uh, over the last 12 months with um, which with really good beneficiation recoveries and leach um, recoveries um, and it really lays a strong foundation for our PFS um, later this year. Look, in, in terms of um, the, the lithium market, I think the, the key the key takeaway I, I want to leave you with is that the long-term fundamentals are rock solid. Um, you know, there will be a material supply deficit at the end of the decade. Clearly, there's some, some short-term softness in the market, no doubt. Um, this has been on the back of higher prices, which has incentivized, you know, more production to come in the market. Um, and inventories are also built up, which have compounded the issue. But I think the mainstream media have conflated, conflated um, what's going on in the market as demand destruction, and that just isn't right. Um, 2024, you know, is expected to have, uh, um, you know, a growth rate of in the order of 20%, you know, from 1 million tonnes last year to 1.3 million tonnes this year, thereabouts. Um, and to date, EV growth has been particularly strong. Um, China, um, it's led by China and the rest of the world, North America and Europe, um, you know, the, has been slower than expected. Um, and energy um, storage really has um, exceeded the expectations. Um, it's, it's clearly the uh, fastest growing energy segment and will be a, a big part of demand in a couple of years' time. And really, the, the, the really encouraging thing from a US perspective is, is we've really seen um, a lot of the automakers, um, um, while they've been losing money on their electric um, vehicle businesses, they're really um, doubling down on producing lower cost electric vehicles over the next couple of years. I'd encourage listeners to to look up some of the recent um, interviews that Jim Farley from Ford, the CEO of Ford, has um, put out there that really underline um, their commitment um, to EVs. Um, you know, to to distill to, to distill his languages. If they if they can't make um, these EV um, EVs work, well, then the future of Ford's really in question. So the intent's there, and it's a um, we're encouraged that you know um, over the next couple of years we'll really see that um, trajectory in North America improve. But more broadly, from a lithium market, we expect double-digit growth over the next um, decade at least. Um, at the very simplest level, you know, supply needs to dump, double every five years. And then if you overlay that with the current price environment, there's sort of consensus that where the pricing is at the moment is, you know, almost half of what the uh, long-term incentive pricing is. And so, um, you know, for people that have been around commodity markets know that the cure for low prices is low prices. So um, we've seen a lot of project delays um, in in both um, Australia and North America. We're starting to see um, some genuine supply response. We're seeing Mount Catlin shut um, or um, put on care and maintenance in um, Australia. We've seen um, even the Chinese integrated producers, CATL, the other week announced, um, uh, you know, production being uh, uh, shut down. These these are these are really positive signs from a market um, that we're bottoming out. So I think... Um, you know, investors can have confidence that um, we'll see an upswing um, in due course. It's just a matter of a matter of timing. Look, I've um, I've alluded to it earlier in the presentation um, uh, around our government support, but I really wanted to unpack the momentum that we're building in this space. Um, early this month, we announced that we'd executed a strategic. Um, uh, um, Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, the acronym that, that they use is CRADA with the, with the DOE as part of their Critical Minerals Innovation Hub um, led by AIMS Laboratory. Uh, AIMS, um, you're probably not familiar with, but they're really a blue chip research organisation. They're obviously part of the DOE, but they have their roots in producing uranium metal for the Manhattan Project, um, you know, crucial to winning the Second World War. So they've, they've got real... Um, uh, credentials around not just the research but actually bringing stuff into um, into production. Um, the, 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 under this um, crater, the members will undertake our, you know research and development over a two year period, um, looking at in, innovative ways to improve our our existing flow sheet at McDermott. And I think it's really important to put it in context. We already have a strong base case that'll perform part of the PFS, but this work really um, is forward looking work that will potentially enhance um, the base case both in terms of um, cost outcomes, but also sustainability outcomes, uh, which is really important for you know creating um, you know value for that broader set of stakeholders and and, and a key part of our um, strategy. Uh, so in essence, you know the partnership brings together you know some real um, blue chip prestigious universities, Oregon State University, Lawrence Berkeley, University of Reno Nevada, but also ha involves um, as a team member the local permitting agency, which is the Oregon Mines Department. Um, uh, the, um, the acronym being Dagami there, 
Um, so we've really got you know a, 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 the right mix of people to, and um, and the right structure to add value to um, McDermott um, as part of the, the funding structure. The DOE will fund the work um, and we'll provide in-kind work. So it's a really um, favourable outcome for Jindalee shareholders. Um, and I think it really speaks to the, the buy-in that we're getting um, at different levels of, of um, the US government. Um, in particular, uh, um, a US um, senior federal senator you'll see on the announcement, you know, was a real key advocate of this. Um, uh, Crater, Senator, senator Ron White, and uh, again, which just points to that, that same theme. Uh, on the right-hand side here, um, you know, we've got a, we're up, currently updating our DOD grant application um, on the back of, you know, some of the information we have out of the, the PFS work to date. Excuse me. The, we were quite excited about this. Obviously, um, there's still uncertainty um, and subject to, you know, award, award decision. But this has potential to materially co-fund the next phase of work being a feasibility study, um, a drill program and, and metallurgical test work. And um, and we're really excited to, um, to hopefully update the market on the on the progress of this in the in the second half of uh, this year. Just to recap, over the past uh, twelve months, you know we've made significant progress uh, de-risking the project despite the market headwinds, um, and we've really installed the team now that can unlock the future of of McDermott. Um, looking forward, you know there's a number of value catalysts as I've outlined, um, including the PFS, which will be key. Um, as well as that government funding piece. Um, you know, Jinder Lee is clearly trading at, at very low um, valuation by any um, uh, foreseeable metric. And really at, at this valuation, it presents, you know, what we see as an asymmetric um, risk profile with substantial upside. Uh, I'd encourage um, investors to take a closer look at what, you know, we believe is an emerging sort of top tier uh, generational asset that, you know, has a potential for large scale um, US lithium chemical um, production. With that, um, hand it over uh, for, for questions. Thank you very much, Ian. That was really insightful, mate. Um, very, very good to go into detail there. So, um, yeah, as I said, I invite the audience. If you have any questions that you want to be asked, feel free to put it um, in the Q&A function. But I guess just for a start, um, so I know the US government has recently hand, handed out a number of grants to encourage you know, a sort of domestic American, American critical mineral supply chain. Um, where do Jinder Lee's government grant applications currently stand at the moment, would you say? Yep. Um, so we've got the, the Department of Defence um, grant um, outstanding. There was recently some Department of Energy grant funding announced um, in the last week or so as well, um, um, particularly geared to more, um, to more uh, developed Opportunities um, contributing to the the capital to build the build projects, and we did have a um an application in in, in those. Um, but you know we we are in fact encouraged to apply apply for ones down the track. Um, given that you know the funding to build a actual project for from a Jinder Lee point of view is you know a number of years into the future. Our focus remains on this um, Department of Defence one. That's potential near term um, funding, and you know um, potentially really. Um, you know, reduces the amount of, um, you know, equity capital that we'd have to um, potentially um, raise in future phases. So we, we're, um, that's what we're focused on and excited about. Brilliant, brilliant. And um, obviously I think everyone knows there's been a bit of an oversupply in lithium and that shot the price right down. So are, are you seeing signals that the lithium price and market actually has sort of bottomed and that lithium prices might be swinging up over the next year or so? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I sort of touched on it before, but I think, um, uh, yeah, we're starting to see a genuine supply response, response in, in, in China. I mean, um, arguably, a lot of the um, Chinese production is underwater at the moment. Um, and, you know, China's showed a, a certain propensity to sort of leave that, um, you know, loss making operation because it, it benefits their integrated operations and allows them to procure um, with him more cheaply elsewhere, but there's there's clearly limits to that. And we've seen we've seen that in um, in in uh, just recent recent weeks. Um, on the other side of that, if you look at you know analysts um, supply models, you know they they've got big um, or reasonable surpluses in the next you know well depending on the analyst in you know next year or two. But if you go dig deeper, like there's a bunch of Greenfield, Western World, um, refined capacity that needs to come online. 
and we know for, for a fact that um, that you know these current prices don't support that. So what what we'll ultimately see is is, is um, some of these near term projects push out um, and a and a price correction at one point. Um, obviously, the million dollar question is when, um, but we're starting to see those really positive signs that the market's responding. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant, totally agree with that. And I know, look, I think given McDermott already hosts the largest lithium, I guess, resource in the United States, um, would you say Jim Lee's focus more on growing that resource or using exploration sort of efforts to target high-grade subsets of, of that existing resource? Yeah, it's it's definitely um, the latter. Um, we've, um, you know, our... Future drill programs, by and large, will be all focused on um, infill, infill drilling um, from from a McDermott perspective, at least, um, and um, better understanding what we've what we've already got. We've already recognised some high grade parts of the um, ore body, but you know we expect you know further drilling to sort of improve upon that. Brilliant. All right, and I do uh, just have some questions from the audience, just to sort of I guess finish this off. Um, one asks, will, will Jindalee's McDermott Lithium project have a similar production cost profile as the nearby Thacker Pass project? Yeah, it'll be similar, um, similar production profile um, to to um, to Thacker Pass. Um, there is, you know, there there are there are we were in the same caldera. Um, their deposit is very similar to ours, um, but there also, there is also some 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 differences. There's a slightly higher grade. Um, uh, ours is um, uh, has at least the work to date has indicated higher recoveries, um, and there is some differences um, in the flow sheet. Although you know there, there's um, the the very similar in some regards, um, and we think you know um, based on what we know today, yeah, we think um, we're targeting a, a similar similar production rate, and we don't think that the um, the cost parameters will be too different. Brilliant. Thanks for that. And um, what would you say the likelihood at the moment um, of the, you know, the D Department of Defence grant is in getting approved? What, what was the reason that the Department of Energy was, was denied? Um, the key theme from the, the Department of Energy one, noting that we would, you know, um, the week prior we'd executed the, um, the, the, um, that strategic agreement I spoke to, um, uh, was around um, predominantly the, the stage. We were basically encouraged to apply for the next round. If you have a look at um, the groups um, that were successful um, in that Department of Energy round, um, they were almost you know post feasibility study. Um, there was a strong focus on recycling um, and looking for you know um, more near term um, um, funding. Given that you know the the funding ask was in the order of you know hundreds of millions of dollars, so. Um, that's, I guess, the context around that one. Um, the Department of Defence, you know, it's hard to put a probability um, to it. You know, we've had strong engagement um, um, with with the De Department of Defence. We're we're certainly um, optimistic. Um, we've always maintained that this is, I guess, the most critical, um, not critical, most exciting um, for us because it has the near term, the near term potential. Um, the longer term financing piece, um, you know, I think we'll think um, will be solvable through through um, either you know further Department of Energy grants, and noting we've got a couple of years to to actually you know be successful in that to actually fu to fund um, the ultimate development. But also, there's a range of um, you know we, we're doing the groundwork now to prepare for a range of um, uh, you know the loan um, loan different loan programs through both the Department of Energy, but also um, the import export bank, um, US is it's called Exim. And really, um, if you have a look at, say, with the Americas or others, or even um, uh, Iron Ear, um, there's other examples in the, in the US. But that really project finance piece is um, is probably more more important than um, some of the from some of the grant applications. Essentially, getting eighty percent of your capex funded for um, you, know, you know cheaper than you can borrow money to buy a house in Australia for um, with a, with a tenor over you know 24, 25 years. Um, that's um, unheard of in the in the mining um, project finance landscape and um, is uh, really um, going to be a focus of us as we, you know, move through the work programs um, over the coming um, years. Brilliant. All right. Thank you for that presentation, Ian. That was really insightful. I'm sure the audience loved that, whether it be prospective or current shareholders. Um, yeah, guys, the audience, if, if you guys want to watch this back, this is being recorded and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. So feel free to watch it there. But um, other than that, is there any final comments or 
Anything you want to add to that, Ian? No, um, I think I think that's we've covered most of the points. I just encourage um, um, people to keep their eyes peeled for the for the PFS um, over the coming um, weeks. Brilliant. All right, thank you. I think that's going to wrap us up for today. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, Ian, for um, you know being a great guest. And until next time, thanks, guys. Thanks.